Hello everyone and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you've joined us. This is a great summer show and we're gonna talk about all kinds of summer opportunities and maybe issues, I don't know, we'll find out. But my name is Diane Nolan and I host uh, the show, but I also teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department on the Urbana Champaign campus. Well, this has been a great week. I think in the last week, I've probably had the best vegetables, carrots, green beans, kohlrabi, sweet corn, tomatoes, really good tomatoes this year. And it's been a really good year. So we're hoping we get some of those questions, but we'll find out from you. But first I want you to know who's here and who's gonna be answering the question. So I'm gonna throw it over first to you, Dr. Bob Skirvin. Well, <clears throat> hello, I was gonna say good morning, but it's not morning. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> well, hello, I'm glad to be here too. My name is Bob Skirvin. I, I teach horticulture at University of Illinois also. For, did it for a long time. And it's summertime, and right now there's all sorts of summer fruits coming in. My specialty is really fruit crops, and there's a lot of summer fruits come in. We've been eating fresh peaches. They're, they're really delicious. You ought to get peaches. If you, if you haven't got a farmer's market, you haven't got in your backyard, you ought to get some. They're really good. And there's other things coming in, and what I want to show you here is also, it's, it's, a, it's blackberry season. And there are all sorts of blackberries, and if you, if you don't have any backyard, and you can get them in the grocery store and they're really very inexpensive and they're really delicious and they're like the raspberry. We've seen the raspberry has been coming in now for a long time. That they're always in the grocery store now and they're always good. And the blackberries are moving on like that too. And they really are good. They get, you can season your teeth all the time, <laughs> but they really are good. And the backyard ones are nice. There's, a, there's new varieties that you ought to be thinking about if you want to plant blackberries. They're coming out of Arkansas. There's some. They're, they're, the first word is prime, and that means that what they have typed that in the fall. It used to be the old-fashioned blackberries would bloom during midsummer, and then that was the end of it. Then the new type, uh, they take and flower in the fall. So they they just start they flower during the midsummer and they start coming in. And right now, one of my one of my colleagues, my friend, sent pictures of the great great, great big blackberries right in the backyard that are thornless and they're delicious and they're, they're, they're prime, I can't remember the second part of it, but look, look for that prime, the bar, prime, prime arc from Arkansas. So it's that would place. actually be after Japanese beetle season. Yeah, it might be. That's, you know, Interesting. The, the idea was that in the, in the past, the blackberries have got killed by the frost. And so these guys, the new canes that come up off the growth in the in early spring, they come up after the frost occurred, the blackberry, then they produce their flowers and they fruit in the fall. And so you don't have to worry about frost anymore. I mean, maybe Japanese beetles might be another thing too. Interesting. They're very nice. So there are new ones, take and watch for those. You can, you can look at your catalogs or get online. But the best ones right now that come out are really good from Arkansas and they have their prime as the first part. So okay. they, they flower. In the mid, uh, and Dr. Skirvin knows about it because he has a few thornless blackberry yeah. patents. Right. So we, 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 like yeah, a bunch. Did, did a lot of work for a long time with yeah. it. Okay, thank you, Bob, very much. Yep. Well, in the middle, I'm going to throw it to you, Jennifer Fishburn. Hi, I'm Jennifer Fishburn. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, serving Logan, Menard, and Sagamon counties. Um, I enjoy talking about herbs and vegetables. Um, so this evening, I've brought with me a tomato, and um, we live in central Illinois, and we do produce great tomatoes, but uh, many times it's not without some kind of issues. Uh, what you're seeing on this tomato here is some cracking. You'll also see ones that have concentric rings. Um, that is caused a lot of time, most of the times um, uh, where we, they're ripening and we've had some dry period followed by a lot of rain and that forces that or hap to happen. Uh, ways you can minimize that is you can, um, ahead of time is to mulch your plants. Um, also, uh, water them consistently throughout the dry periods. Don't allow them to dry out. Um, that can help with that as well. Um, but they're still great, edible, and tasty. They just look not perfect, um, which makes them even taste better. <laughs> yep. Oh, beautifully spoken. <laughs> that would include a lot of fruits and vegetables. That's right. <laughs> so, well done, Jennifer, thank you. And to my left, we're gonna throw it to you, Dr. Don White, known as Dr. Don. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> I am Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. And while I was on the faculty, I taught introductory plant pathology to a number of people. <laughs> I taught diseases of field crops and diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses. 
<laughs> and also did work on genetic resistance to disease in corn. More recently, I have become a master gardener. I've really enjoyed the training, and I think it's a wonderful volunteer opportunity. And for other people from the faculty who retire, I hope you will <laughs> join me. And tonight, for the first one, of course, if it's diseased, I like it. Of course. This, this is a blue spruce. All right, now this is the way a blue spruce should look. And what you have with blue spruce, you can have up to five years of growth in needles it'll stay alive, okay? So this is new growth, and then you go back, your previous growth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't want to cut all the way back. All right, this is what it should look like. <laughs> this Next. is one of my buddies. This is Rhizosphera, and this is R-H-I-Z-O-S-P-H-A-E-R-A, -E needle cast. I think it ought to be a blotch. But needle cast, and what happens, what you see <coughs> on this plant is you see the new year's, this year's growth is still colorful, but the previous years are gone for the most part, as with this one it's not as bad, but it's still not all that good. Now what happens here, this is kind of interesting, at least to me, these new needles are already infected by the fungus. Oh. And see, they're, they're going to get diseased. Because what happens, spring of the year, new growth comes out, and these older needles back in here have already been infected by the fungus. The fungus then kills the needle very rapidly and produces spore producing structures that produce spores that splash out onto the new growth. Mm -hmm. So then the new growth will look good for one year, and then the next year it gets hammered. That's a pathology word. I'm sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this disease has is is been a real problem on blue spruce. Uh, Norway spruce, which is the green one, uh, is fairly resistant. You don't have a problem with it. Uh, I guess bagworms are really sad because they don't get a shot at this spruce on this. And there's just not, there's one thing you can do for it. You can spray when the new growth just starts to come out and then again about three weeks later. But on some of these older trees, it's hard to get up to the top of them. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to control it for two or three years. And that is the problem. Because if you don't control it for two or three years, so you've already got these things infected. And if you have a windbreak, if you get it on one, yes, won't you eventually have it it's on? It's going to be on all of them. Oh, that's sad. Well, but I, occasionally mm -hmm. I keep driving around and almost wrecking the car looking at stuff. But occasionally I'll see a few of them that don't look as bad, so I kind of wonder if there isn't some differences in susceptibility there. Which would be great if Which you makes, had those. It's usually the way it is. So not a really good choice right at this moment for people in the middle, middle America. Yeah, I used to really like blue spruce, but I'm starting to less so like them. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, well thank you, because okay. when you get a big tree and you've only got one year's growth, that's a dead interior. That's well, I had really one that was even better than this. Worse, you mean? I went <laughs> <laughs> Pathologists think better went, is It was worse than this, worse. but I, I went back to get the specimen off of it, and it was already gone through the grinder that cut oh. it out, so there went my specimen. Okay, these disease specialists, aren't they something? Okay, thank you, Dr. Don. Well, let's go to our special Did You Know section next. Grapes don't only taste good, they also help cure asthma, indigestion, migraine, kidney disease, and fatigue. So try grapes the next time you are not feeling well. Wow, that's something. Okay. Grapes are also poisonous to dogs, they don't give them to dogs. Interesting. Wow, we learned so much here. Yeah. Well, to follow up on um, Bob's blackberries, we have a question about blackberries on line two. So let's go to PJ's question. Hi there, PJ. Line two. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bob's blackberries. I've had them for years and years, the thornless kinds, and I've been delighted with them. Uh, what I want to know is, uh, tell me what's the best times and what to fertilize with. Oh, okay. The uh, question was about fertilization, when you, when you fertilize these. 
Well, what I, I fertilize them in the in the in late late winter, and you can also do it in late fall. The trouble is, if you fertilize right now, is you'll stick and stimulate the plants to start growing. And it, and if they start growing, then when winter time does come, they're more likely to be damaged. So pro probably late late fall. If you wait until uh, yeah, midwinter, the ground's frozen. It's not very good then. But pro probably late fall or er early early spring before the plants start to grow are, is going to be the best. So that's that's what I would do. Would you talk also a little bit about pruning? Because we get that question oh, yeah. so much. And the, you know, the, the, other, the other thing about blackberries is, is really kind of odd, is bl blackberries, you should prune during the, during the winter time. And you can do some pruning during the year if they're getting in the way and the thorns are coming out and ripping in your children apart. And so, but uh, during the winter time is the best time to prune them. And, and, and the way blackberries and, and raspberries grow is they have a, uh, the growth that produces the fruits, when, it, when, as a pr when it's finished producing fruits, it's going to die. And so you need to go back and cut that out. And you should do that during the winter time. You can do it early if you want to because it's going to die. And make room for the new canes to come up. Now in the case of uh, blackberries, what, you know, the thornless blackberries in particular, the way you take and prune them is you take and, if you just let them grow straight, the, they get 15, 20 foot canes. They're huge. And they're thornless, but they're these monster things. And so, uh, when uh, oh probably early maybe even midsummer you can take and cut, you cut back the top and make them branch some so the branches come out but they then you don't do any more pruning until near springtime real late winter it turns out the blackberries the way blackberries die is the in winter kill is they start at the very tip and they die this way and mm -hmm. so what happens is you would think well you got these six six like uh, little shoots come out the side you cut them back a bit but what will happen if you cut them back like this they'll start dying right here and you may lose your whole plant and so you want to just leave leave that part alone until uh, near, near springtime and then you can take and prune the plant back otherwise you'll take and lose the plant so, so you've it's, so actually it's a different, killed your different plant. sort of pruning for the thornless blackberries in particular okay well thank you because people and asked that question so i wanted you to tell us about it Okay, let's go to the next question and Carol's question on line three about sycamore. Hi, Carol. Line three. Okay, well, um, I act she said something about bark on sycamore. Is that something, Jennifer, you want to discuss what is going on with the sycamore? <laughs> I'm well, looking at Jennifer. Um, <laughs> many times with sycamore trees, we see bark shedding on those. That's just kind of a, a, a natural thing that they do. Um, it just It's just part of being a sycamore tree, just like anthracnosis in the spring. Um, and that's why they're so good in urban sites, because mm -hmm. it just releases any kind of pollution or build up. It'll do it in drought. It does it along the river. It, it's just part of being, like you said, a sycamore. <laughs> so anyway, I think we, I think we answered Carol's question, but you know, if she wants to call back, she sure can. All right, let's go to line four, and we have a question about a pine tree. Hello there, line four. Hi, uh, um, Debbie. I have two pine trees that are like five feet apart, and one is losing its needles. And it kind of looks like a uh, little milky, I don't know, on the side. Of the needle or on? No, it's actually on the stump. Uh, okay, on the tree. Okay. Uh-huh. And it's lost quite a lot of needles. And it's next to another one, which is beautiful. Is there something I should do? I don't even know what it is. Well, to start with what it is, she might take a sample. Yeah, it depends on if you're looking at the exterior needle shedding or the interior needle shedding. Um, also depends on the time of year. During certain times of the years, they will have a natural shed um, if it's the interior needles. Um, but but the there white are, powder? That sap probably is oh, what okay. I'm guessing she's talking about. Scale. Oh, go ahead. Or what? Cottony scale. Could be. Could be an insect. And could it cause the needle shed? I wouldn't think so. I think usually they don't get that bad. Now five feet apart is a little close. Yeah. It could be some Also depends on stress. When, she, when she planted it, um, if they were planted recently or within the last five years. 
Um, could be some water stress mm -hmm. on them or improper planting, um, not having um, the right soil conditions. Um, pines can do okay here, but um, they also don't do really well um, in poor soil conditions. Okay. So there are some possibilities <laughs> for In my you. backyard, I think about taking out the bad one, like give, let the other one give it plenty of room to grow. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. It'll be a lot healthier in a few years. You won't know the difference. It'll fill in and right. it'll be a more beautiful specimen. Because that sounds really close for any tree except maybe a shrub. Mm -hmm. Some shrubs, that's too close. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe feet, a boxwood, it'd be okay. Five feet's really close. That's very close. And you don't want to plant it five feet from your house <coughs> either. So, well, let's go on to um, a question on line two. And Julie has a question for us. Hi, Julie. Yes. What is My your question? My question is, what is Bishop's weed? I hear it's good for erosion on hillsides. Bishop's weed, do you remember that from class, Jennifer? I <laughs> <Okay>. do. <laughs> okay, it's all yours <laughs> No, then. but I can't remember which one it is. Well, it's um, it is podium Podogarium variegatum. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is a ground cover <laughs> type plant. Thank you. Um, that you could use. Uh, we, we recommend that a lot of times on hillsides, particularly where you can't mow, that you do put ground covers in. Um, and but this once, will be. But once you do plant it, you will have it for the forever. rest of your and the property's natural life. Well, mm -hmm. and hence the word ground cover. Many yeah. of our ground covers do have that tendency that they quote, have invasive type properties that they will take over. And, and that's good in that situation, but you do want to somehow control it so it stays within its boundaries. Um, and do be cautious of some ground covers because they do get overly aggressive and that's not a good thing. Um, Mint also is a great ground cover. That's but, one I oh, like. Oh, wow. <laughs> but that's wow, a scary that thought. will be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if there's a neighbor nearby, that's something to be concerned about. But if it's a hillside that's going down to a road or an interstate or a chasm, something that <laughs> the plant won't root across. You can plant kudzu, too. So. Yeah, yeah, Please yeah. don't. Please yeah, don't. Yeah, don't plant kudzu. <laughs> this so, heard that. <laughs> uh, every now and then you do need to research thugs. What is going to take over? So, but that will do a hillside. You did a great job, Jennifer, thank you. Well, let's take a moment and go back around to doing an email or a show and tell. So Bob, we're gonna start with you. Okay, I got a qu question here that uh, phoned in, Charlotte Green phoned in, she has some uh, strawberries and her strawberries here are convinced that they have verticillium and, the, and they're showing the symptoms and ba basically what happens with verticillium is the plants look real healthy until all of a sudden they don't look healthy and they kind of, they kind of melt, just melt down. And often when they melt down, it isn't the case that the whole planting goes, it'll be kind of like, it'll be 10, then all of a sudden you have one die out, then another one over here is this verticillium. And, uh, and verticillium wilt is a very common disease. And I, I would just, I looked up a little bit here and there's like 300 different plants get it. It's the sa same species, it's a very, very common problem. And, the, and many strawberries, particularly some of the older cultivars, are very susceptible to it. And there's really not much you can do except take and get verticillin resistant cultivars. And there are a lot of verticillin resistant cultivars. And, uh, and this one, it, if it's just a few plants wilting down, it's really not a serious problem. It's a, you know, you don't want it, but it's not there. And so it's okay. But if you get, get onto a catalog, a, fr a fruit catalog, or get online at different companies, and look at their strawberries, they'll have a list and they'll have some of the, it'll say verticillium resistance and that's what you want. Now the other question that Charlotte Green said that she was uh, concerned about that she's been mulching her strawberries and she's been mulching them with her mulch pile over here with, that ha apparently has everything in it. It's just kind of like my, my mulch pile, we throw all the potato peels, everything goes in it. And she's concerned about whether or not that's where the disease is coming. And it's, it's entirely possible that's a, that's a, pr a problem mm -hmm. there that, that she might have some clean land or had some clean land that, that she's reinfecting with the verticillium. But probably the best thing to do is go back to your seed catalog and go back to your the catalog and look specifically for cultivars that are resistant to verticillium and then okay. and, and replant with those. Great, thank you very much for mm -hmm. that. And now, Jennifer. Uh, I have a viewer question. Uh, Pamela's tomatoes are, are starting to ripen beautifully. However, the leaves are developing spots. Um, she needs help diagnosing it, and she wants to know if this uh, problem will shorten the life of her tomatoes. Um, 
the four of us concurred that we're not uh, quite certain. We said it could actually look like a virus, which is different than a disease. Um, my suggestion, Diane, would be that they take it to their local extension office to start off mm -hmm. if they can take a sample in. Um, to the, uh, uh, there's an extension office in every office in the state and they can, they can help point you in the right direction. Um, but I guess going backwards, what I just want to encourage people to think about is when you do plant tomato plants, um, look for those that have disease resistance built in the, in the plant. Um, also buy healthy plants to start. Look, on the, look at the leaves very closely when you buy your transplants. Um, mulch them if you can. Um, that helps prevent splashing of the soil, uh, which wouldn't necessarily help with the virus, but that could help with splashing of some of the diseases. Um, water them consistently. Make sure you're following a good fertilizer program with them. Um, they, they, you really can't just plant them and hope that you're going to have a perfect tomato mm -hmm. plant. Um, you'll have a few problems, but they'll still turn out okay most of the time. Um, but in this case, we're just, we're, we're not quite certain. Um, I brought one show and tell a little bit unrelated to this, and uh, this we believe is bacterial spot here on these tomatoes. Um, again, a disease problem uh, uh, carried over sometimes from year to year, so you wanna make sure that you do rotate as well. Don't use the same spot mm -hmm. to put your tomatoes in every year. Um, and if you're using a container, replace that soil each year um, before replanting in it. I was just thinking about rotating when you said it. There is a plant clinic um, screen that we can put up if she wants to send yes. it directly. Uh, and your local extension office can help you with sending, helping, sending things to the plant clinic as well. Because um, they know not to put it in plastic when it comes exactly. mushy. and so Th there's, we'll, a, there's a knack to it. Don't just put it in a little envelope and mail off the leaf. <laughs> right. Well, good. Uh, Pam, thanks for your... Um, picture so we can help out and thank you Jennifer. Okay, Dr. Don. Yes, I'm going to start off with leaf scorch. Now this is physiological leaf scorch and basically what you see on this poor oak tree is that what happens here is it is dead between the veins and what happens with this tree is planted next to a sidewalk which is right next to a street that is right next to a parking lot and on the other side about five foot of grass and then another parking lot. And what happens is the root systems are probably damaged. It takes up water but it can't take up enough water to satisfy the needs of the entire leaf. So what happens? The part of the leaf that's right next to the big vein gets the water first mm -hmm. and so it's green and then the stuff in the middle it gets water last. Well it did get water so it dies. And leaf scorch can be seen on oaks and maples and things like that. But I have another one. I like this one, <laughs> as you can tell. This is a tulip tree. Well, some people will call it tulip poplar, but it's closer to a magnolia. My granddaughter brought me this, wanted to know what was wrong with it. And I knew because I'd looked for this one before, this is also leaf scorch. But really it is rather different. And all the books have pretty much agreed that this is a physiological leaf scorch. And that this is just the way it looks on tulip poplar. It's so which, different. It is just so unique. And I think it's kind of cool. And I explained to her that it was because the roots were probably compromised in this one. She gave me that look like you're teasing me. We can't talk about roots. I got a leaf in my hand. <laughs> but it took a while. But I think I finally got it apart across to her. This is leaf scorch. And this tree, right down the block from it, there's one that doesn't have any leaves like this at all. So this one's under stress. And I'm going to see if she remembers it. Now the problem is, she's only five years old. So we'll oh. just have to wait and see what happens. Start them early. Oh, well, I'm working on it. <laughs> That is so interesting because I, I would know. recognize the oak right away as leaf scorch, but I would not have recognized the no. tulip tree as that. It just looks like either even insects, maybe some little. But when I was a graduate student, we worked in a plant clinic at Ohio State. We ripped them up and looked for fungi and all kinds of stuff. And then we would look at the book and it was all oh, leaf scorch. Nah, Great. but it is. Wow, they couldn't be more different. No. And for some people, we've had a lot of rain, but other folks in the middle America have had very intermittent rain. So, and even if you've had good rain, it could be stressful. Well, the problem with tulip poplar 
or tulip trees is the the roots a lot of times are not real good. Okay. A lot of them are hollow in the middle because the carpenter ants get in there. Now they're just destroying the dead wood, but they but still get still. in there and kind of hollow them right. out. And they're always, if they get start getting like this, then just be very careful that you don't have a okay. fork in it and half of it's going to fall towards the house. Oh my. So be, And use it as a diagnostic to see if your tree is yeah, coming your way. Yeah, this will tell you if way. the tree is healthy or not. Right. Wow. This has been a lot of of course, I'm a horticulturalist. A lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> See, so all dead plants. <laughs> well, dead and, plant. and challenges in the landscape. And so I'm glad that we've got so many gardeners out there who are interested in learning more. And we love to hear from you. So thank you so much for watching. And I want to thank you three for being here. Really appreciate it. We hope that you get out and look at your garden, scout it out to see what's going on, and have a great week gardening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.